Open with me your Bibles, please, to Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians chapter 2. We're going to be looking in just a moment uh, in verses 11 through 14. Uh, before we do, we're going to give just a brief review uh, to bring us back up to speed as a part two of last week's message on origin, race, and racism. And uh, to bring us up to speed, I'm just going to say a few things and then uh, expound on it a little bit further this week, and then we'll get into Galatians 2. Um, we, we posed the question to you last week, and the question was this, uh, if we are all... We are all the creation of God and we're all descended from Adam, then there cannot be different races. And if there are not different races or categories of people, then how do you have racism? And we answer the question by saying that there are two ways that you can have racism. And the two ways that you can have racism, number one is quite simply one word, it is called sin. And one of the aspects of sin, Galatians 5 verse 20, teaches that one of the works of the flesh or the nature of sin within us is hatred. And so wherever there is sin, there's going to be hatred. And wherever there's sinners, you're going to have hateful things. That's nothing new. All you have to do is go back to Genesis chapter 4 and you see the first brothers, Cain, murdered his brother Abel. Hatred. Sin. And then number two, we said to you, uh, perhaps something that I'd like to make a little bit bigger of a deal about today is simply this, that it comes from uh, ideologies that are both taught and learned, uh, belief systems that are contrary to biblical Christianity. And we began to list a number of those, such as a critical race theory, intersectionality, uh, conflict, warfare, uh, class conflict, class warfare, evolution. We named a number of these different uh, um, ideologies or belief systems that are contrary to the gospel and to the word of God. And that these belief systems take the sinfulness or the hatred within the sinful human heart and they stir them up or foment. I kept using the word foment. It foments or stirs up the hatred uh, within sinful human people. It doesn't solve the problem. Rather, it stirs up the problem and creates civil unrest between people. So that was uh, what we said. And my thesis statement to you was simply this, that... The only answer, and, and I am going to say it's not very often that you can use an exclusive claim, but we can. The only answer to this problem of race and racism is the gospel and to develop within us as converts to Christ a biblical worldview. If we do not develop that, you will never solve the problem. Okay? So, I'm going to add on to it now this morning and add a little something into that. that was, that's an introduction to get you back up to speed as to what we've been talking about. And the, uh, the thing I want to say is this, is that for, for us as Christians, our theology, theology meaning the study of God, our bibliology, the study of the Bible, must inform our biology, our anthropology, our sociology, our psychology. We start with the Bible. We start with our, our knowledge of God, our study of God in the Bible. And we process the study of our society, the study of mankind, we, the study of origins. And we study those things through the lens of the Bible, through the lens of our understanding of God. Now what has happened, sadly, in many churches, in many pastors, in many seminaries, many Bible schools, universities, uh, secular and, and Christian alike, is that we have begun to, instead of process things from the place of theology and bibliology, 
into these other things as we've started now with sociology, psychology, and these other types of things, biology, and then we've gotten down to, you know, theology somewhere down here. So you don't start with these other things, you start with our understanding of the Word of God. Okay? And with that in mind now, we as Christians, we must reject fully. We must reject the ideology, the philosophies that are being taught, as we had referred to just earlier. We cannot accept, okay, we cannot accept critical race theory. We cannot accept uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. We can't accept, you know, uh, abortion. We can't accept evolution. We can't accept feminism. We can't accept LGBTQ. We can't accept uh, all these different ideologies of uh, the social justice, social gospel movement. We can't accept those things. Why? And you can go on from there. I'm, I'm going to stop there. There's, there's a whole host of ideologies and philosophies we have to reject. Why do we have to reject them? We have to reject them because they do not agree with the biblical worldview. They do not agree with Scripture. They are ideas that are incongruent, incompatible with Scripture. Whether it's dealing with human origin or the origin of all life, whether it's dealing with the sanctity of human life, whether it's dealing with how God uh, made from one man or one blood every nation of people upon the earth, all descending from one man, from one blood, Adam, Acts 17, verse 26. Right? Uh, whether, it, whether it attacks the, the, the biblical view of, of what a government should be, how it is supposed to function and operate, in the protection of its citizens, not to provide rights. Rights are God-given because God is the creator of us, but to protect, protect the rights that God has given to us as human beings. Um, whether it, it's dealing with gender and gender roles, whether it's dealing with human sexuality, these, these, these movements are leftist ideology that are incompatible with Scripture. And that's why we have to reject them. That's why we can't embrace them. And that's why what concerns me the most, Martin Luther said this. Martin Luther said that if I defend the whole Christian faith at every point, but I don't defend the Christian faith at the point in which it is presently being attacked, I am a coward and a traitor. I would to God that every American pulpit believes that. <laughs> if we believe that, you could look out America because the, the, the things would begin to change for the better. Right? And, and the gospel is under attack from leftist ideology. That's why we have people out there in the church world today preaching uh, social justice and the social gospel message. It's leftist ideology that has to be rejected because it's not compatible with biblical truth. Now, I'm going to say this one last statement before we go to Galatians 2. And that is this, that we have to reject it because it's incompatible with Scripture. It, it doesn't line up with the biblical view of things. That's why we reject them. We are truth-oriented people. Um, if, if we do not have... If we do not have... Truth. We do not have objective truth outside of ourselves by which to govern our lives. Then we become like everybody else. And everybody else basically, as, as the Bible teaches us, everybody does what is right in their own eyes. If, if you don't have an objective standard of truth outside of ourselves, then we just live our lives based on whatever feels good to us. And that's the way that society is driven but we have a standard of biblical truth that we uphold to and adhere to. If not, you would live however you wanted to live. You would do whatever you wanted to do. And that's the issue that I have is that we, as the church, I'm not talking about this church necessarily specifically, but the church world in general, there is a problem when the, the church looks like the world, sounds like the world, and the preachers preach the philosophies of the world. 
Um, when that happens, you can say that dark times are upon us. And dark times are upon us because the church looks like the world, sounds like the world, and the preachers preach like the world. The, the same leftist ideology that is out there is also being found in churches today. So with that in mind, I do not... Um, I do not think that it is safe for us as, as pastors to just assume that people can process social issues of today with a biblical worldview without us teaching people from Scripture what that biblical worldview is so that you can process what's going on in society and in the culture through the, through the lens of Scripture. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 2 uh, for an opening passage, uh, verses 11 through 14. And then we're going we're gonna to talk about seven, several ways, I don't know how many exactly we'll get to today, but several ways that the, uh, that racism, dealing with racism specifically at this time, that racism is incompatible with the gospel. It's uh, antithetical is the, the word I want to use. Racism is antithetical to the gospel. And we're going to give you several reasons why racism is antithetical to the gospel. And then we're going to close with a Christian perspective on identity. How we should view ourselves in light of what the scripture says. So let's go to Galatians chapter 2. The reason for this passage is I want to show you again, there's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, all right? This stuff has been around forever. It's been around since Genesis chapter 4. The idea of sin and hatred, the idea of people hating other people for no apparent reason. Uh, Genesis chapter 4. You know when it's going to end? When Jesus ends it. <laughs> That's it. Okay, but in the meantime, the only answer is the gospel and biblical Christianity. You ready? Verse 11 through 14. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, uh, Antioch, by the way, was a, um, a location where the Gentile church first began to thrive. This became the epicenter for Christianity. It started with Jerusalem, Antioch, later it would be Ephesus. But at this point, it's Antioch, and it was a big Gentile mission. When we say Gentile, all we mean is nations. Every nation outside of Israel is a Gentile nation. So come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Now notice, uh, Peter, being a Jew, has been in Antioch with Paul and, uh, and, and Barnabas and other Jews. And he's been eating with the, the Gentiles and eating their foods. Now, in the Jewish mindset, uh, the Jewish people, you could say, were somewhat racist. They wouldn't eat with Gentiles. It was considered unclean. Gentiles were unclean. The food they ate was unclean. You didn't do anything with them. You didn't associate with them. And, and so this is going on in the church that uh, when, when these men came from, came from Jerusalem, uh, all of a sudden Peter and Barnabas and these other Jews separated from the Gentiles and would no longer eat with them, would no longer fellowship with them. And this is in the church. Okay? This is in the church. This is in the body of Christ that this issue was happening. There was separation for no other reason than you don't subscribe to the traditions of our forefathers. Because you don't subscribe to the tra traditions of Judaism. Therefore, we're not going to eat with you. We're not going to fellowship with you. You're not like us, so we're not going to have anything to do with you. That's a big problem. Like I said, this problem has been around the block. It's not something new. But I want you to see what Paul says in relation to this, verse 14. This, this is profound. This is his simple answer, and, and usually answers are simple. When answers become complex, they're probably the wrong answer. <laughs> Truthful answers are simple answers, right? What, what's, what's, the, what's the answer to, to every marital problem? 
Gentiles to live as Jews. Notice what he said. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, this issue of these people, the Jews, separating from the Gentiles over food and custom and tradition and because they were not like them and now fearing the Jews that came down from James, this right here, Paul saw it as a very simple thing. They're not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Because why? The truth of the gospel says this. That there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither, um, there's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So that all the distinctions that people make. Uh, all those distinctions. Once you come to Christ and you're in Christ. Those distinctions are no longer paramount. Those distinctions are long, no longer important. And, and I thought about that. Galatians 3 verse 28. Jew, Gentile. There's neither uh, slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ. And I thought about that. You know, the whole intersectionality thing says, you know, separation based on, on uh, you know, so-called race or ethnic origin. Um, secondly, on class. Third, on, on gender. All those things are summed up in Galatians 3.28. We don't make distinctions on those things in the church. In the church, we don't care where you came from. We really don't. We don't care your background. We don't care how bad you were, how good you were, how moral you were, how immoral you were. All of it. We don't care what your national origin is. Uh, we don't care you know, what language you speak. We don't care all of the, the, the history that you have. All we care about is now you're in Christ. And in Christ, we're one body in Christ. Christ is not divided. There's no subsets in Christianity. You're either a Christian or you're not. You're either in Christ or you're not. There is no subsets. So in Christ, that is our primary identity. And as our primary identity, identity that's what we look at. And so Paul says the problem is they're not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel. That these distinctions that we have don't matter. And all that matters is salvation by grace through faith in Christ. So Paul simplified this issue of race and racism, if you will, in the early church by saying they needed to be straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Now, interesting, let me say this before we move on. In verse 20... It is kind of the, the ending of this, this passage that he's dealing with this issue. You know what he says? I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You, you know what he's saying? I'm dead. I'm dead in Christ. I, I died. I'm crucified with Christ. Now I'm living, and I'm living by faith in the Son of God. In other words, you know, how, many, how many personal opinions does a dead person have? Not many, right? If, I, if, we had, if, you, if, if, if we had a casket up here with a dead person in it, we could come up here and call him every name in the book. <laughs> Is he going to get upset about it? No. We can come up here and try to categorize him in whatever category we want to put him in, label him with every label we want to label him with, but at the end of the day, he's dead. <laughs> and so are you. So am I. We're dead. We, we've been crucified with Christ, and our only life now is the life 
that we live by faith in the Son of God. So, so we do away with those distinctions. Now, what I want us to do is, um, again, I just wanted to show you that this was an issue even in the early church. You remember in Acts 15, they actually had a, a council meeting. And you know what the council meeting was over in Acts 15? Should we take the gospel to the Gentiles or not? <laughs> I mean, that, that, why would you need to have a special meeting? You know, that, that kind of sums up council meetings, you know, in general with, with you know, denominations and such. You're having meetings about stuff that Jesus already told you what to do. Should we take the gospel to the nations? Uh, well, let's see. Jesus said, um, make disciples of all nations. Of course you should. But they had a council meeting in Acts 15 over whether to, to evangelize the Gentiles. And if so, did they have to have any restrictions placed upon them? So this is nothing new. This is not something that, that has never existed. So now what I want to do is I'm going to talk about seven reasons or seven reasons why racism is antithetical to the gospel. Okay. Number one is racism is prideful. Racism is prideful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the definition, the dictionary definition of race and racism, okay? Listen to this. You'll learn something. From the American Heritage Dictionary, race, a group of people identified as distinct from other uh, groups because of supposed physical or genetic traits shared by the group. It goes on to say, most biologists and anthropologists do not recognize race as a biologically valid classification, in part because there is more genetic variation within groups than between them. Now, we talked about this last week, right, that uh, both biblically and scientifically, biologically, uh, there's no such thing as races. Races is a social construct. It is something that's been thrust upon us. Races is not a biblical concept. And here's, uh, here's the definition for racism from Merriam-Webster's dictionary. A belief that race is the primary, key word right there, primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Number two, also from Merriam-Webster, a doctrine or political program. This is what he said. They're saying racism is a doctrine or political program based on the assumption of racism and designed to execute its principles. It's a doctrine. It's a political program. It's a political or social system founded on racism. You can find that yourself. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. And then the American Heritage Dictionary for the definition on race. It's a social construct, the idea of races. It's not a biblical concept. So number one, it's prideful. It's prideful. Racism is prideful, uh, whereas the gospel requires humility. The gospel requires humility. Racism is prideful because it says that my group of people is superior to your group of people. And my group of people is better than your group of people on no other basis than just simply physical appearance and no other reason at all. And, and that, is, that is a prideful thing. And we know that there are uh, six sins that God hates, seven are an abomination to him. The first thing he says is a proud look. A pride is, is a stench in the nostrils of God. It is not something that is cohesive with the gospel. In fact, I'm going to give you just one scripture um, relating to the fact that the gospel demands humility. Romans chapter 3 verse 9 says this, What then? Are we better than they, the we, Paul speaking, Jews, are we better than they, all the Gentile nations? What do you think he says? Not at all, he says. Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and, and Greeks or Gentiles that they are all under sin. See, uh, Christianity, the gospel comes along and says, uh, obviously, if you need a savior, what does that mean about you? You're a sinner, right? You're a sinner. You're by nature a sinner, and we're all equally sinners before God. So not, not one group of people is more sinful than another group of people. All are sinners before God, and all deserving of the same uh, sentence and judgment. So number one, racism is prideful. The gospel demands humility. 
Secondly, racism divides and the gospel unites. We already mentioned uh, Galatians 3 verse 28 that uh, there's neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, uh, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ, these distinctions disappear and dissipate. The primary identity that we have as Christians is that we are in Christ and nothing else matters. Okay? So that's number two. Number three uh, is that uh, racism looks to people for salvation. The gospel looks to Christ for salvation. Right? But the problem with racism is that it, it looks only to self. It looks at people and it tries to manage the problem by the people. Uh, but the gospel focuses on Christ to get our eyes off of ourselves and get our eyes on Christ and to become imitators of Him. And if you, if you follow Christ in His life, teaching, and ministry, uh, you could never be a racist. Uh, Christ Himself reached out to, for example, the Samaritan woman at the well. There's a hundred, hundreds of years of racism between the Jews and the Samaritans. And yet Jesus broke all of that by witnessing to the woman at the well, leading her to salvation and leading um, many of her villagers and people uh, that she brought out to him that were also uh, received the Lord as a result. Uh, number four is that the uh, racism is exclusive. If, if you're not in my group, if you're not like me, you're not in my group. It's exclusive. The gospel is inclusive. Uh, the gospel is inclusive. Christ said to make disciples of all nations. Christ said to uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Um, and we see this uh, in, the, in the early church that they did begin to, over time, begin to spread the gospel to other people, groups, other nations. All right? So the gospel is inclusive, not exclusive. It doesn't exclude people. It includes people from all walks of life. We read it in Revelation, did we not, in the opening? That he has redeemed us to God out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Right? When we get to heaven, there's going to be people from all over the world there. All different language groups, all different tribes, all different nationalities are going to be in heaven. And, and they're going to look like they came from other nations, all right? They're still going to look like they do now. Well, they might be better looking. Uh, <laughs> but we will all be from different tribes, tongues, people, and nations when we get to heaven. Uh, another thing, another point to make is this, is that... Uh, Racism is rooted in hatred, whereas the gospel is rooted in love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And what does it do that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life? And then what does the gospel do to us who believe? How, how do people know that we are His disciples? John 13, verse 34, 35. By this all men and all people will know that you are my disciples by your love one to another. So the gospel comes from love and it produces love and the adherence to the Christian faith. So racism breeds hatred. Uh, it's rooted in hatred rather. And the gospel is rooted in love. Uh, the next point to make is this, is that uh, racism is, uh, how do I want to word this? It is, it is completely unforgiving whereas the gospel is all about forgiveness a racism wants no part to do with forgiveness what they want is penance the gospel demands repentance it does not demand penance the gospel does not demand that we make restitution for our sins the gospel demands that we repent of our sins so that we turn away from that and we follow Christ but racism demands restitution, it demands penance, it demands a payment, whereas forgiveness is all about the payment of our debts. Forgiveness of our debts. Now, the other thing, the last thing that I want to mention here uh, before we talk about Christian identity is, is this, is that racism, um, what it does, and, and this is common in the intersectionality and social justice movement, is that it, 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 instead of making people personally responsible for their sins, it, it defers that or rejects that and says that their sins...
responsibility of other people. I am the way that I am because you are the way that you are. I'm oppressed. I'm a victim. And you've oppressed me and you've made me a victim. And therefore I can't be free because I, have, I, I live in this society that is oppressive to me. So, so what it does is it seeks to alleviate people from any personal responsibility. And yet the Bible teaches very plainly, Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. And he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap ever, everlasting life. You, life is not like a box of chocolates that you never know what you're going to get. Life is like a boomerang. Whatever you throw out is going to come right back at you. And yet people live their life um, on this, this idea of victimization and, and that sowing and reaping does not apply to them. No, if you make bad choices, you will reap a bad harvest. If you make good choices, you will reap a good harvest. It is proven time and time again. It will be the sum total of the choices you make in life. You make bad choices, you're going to reap a bad harvest. You make good choices, you'll have a good harvest. Sowing and reaping. But again, uh, the social justice doesn't want to hear that. It, it's everybody else's fault. I'm the way that I am because of what you did to me. And, and so with that mentality, you'll never, you'll never exceed or excel from that situation. Now, in closing, I want to say this, and this will be very brief um, as my time is spent at this moment. Um, so what I want to do in closing is, <clears throat> is this. How should a Christian view their identity? There's, again, there's all these labels that, that society wants to put on us. There's all these labels that people want to give us. What is the Christian view of identity? How, how should we view it? Number one, all right, very simple. This is how we should all think. And, and this destroys the hatred between groups um, and, and, the, and the ideology that foments the hatred. Number one, I'm a human. I am descended. I'm the creation of God. I'm descended from Adam and Eve. And as such, all people are the creation of God and descended from Adam and Eve. Therefore, everybody in this world is my brother or my sister in the flesh. Period. I'm a human. Number two, I'm a Christian. And there's three of them. Number two, I'm a Christian. And this identity that I have, not only am I identified with the first Adam, but I'm also identified with the last Adam, Christ. And now my life is identified in Christ, that I don't, this is the primary, the supreme identity that I have. I am a Christian first and foremost, and any label the world seeks to put on me has nothing, it has nothing, no hold, no grip on me. My identity is in Christ. I'm identified in the last Adam. I'm a human, and I'm a Christian. And as a Christian, I have a special relationship with people, hear me, out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. I have a special relationship with them because not only are they my brothers in the flesh, my biological brothers and sisters, they are also my spiritual brothers and sisters. Even though they don't look like me, they don't talk like me, they don't sound like me. I remember when I would, would, would go overseas I've been doing missionary work for about a decade. Um, one of the favorite things I would tell people, I remember sitting and having a meal. I was in the southern part of the Philippines in, in Dipolog City. I was sitting and having a meal with some pastors uh, from the pastors conference. Those that were helping me to set it up and organize it, they were all native pastors. I, I always worked with the natives. And... Um, and then they, one of the servers or waiters asked me, you know, what was I doing there? And I said, well, I'm visiting family. <laughs> I was. I was visiting family. They were my brothers in the flesh. Even though we didn't look alike, they were my brothers in the flesh, all descended from Adam. There's not a separate point of origin for them. And number two, they're my brothers in Christ. So I'm related to them physically. And I'm related to them spiritually. I'm, I'm visiting family. That's what I'm doing. And, 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 you know, furthermore, you're related to me too 
But I'd like for you to be related to me in Christ as well. <laughs> now see, if you thought like that, if you just spent your whole life thinking like that, make life a whole lot easier. And then number three, uh, the last thing is this. Uh, number three, I'm a citizen of this country. I'm an American. So I'm a person, I'm a human, I'm a Christian, and I'm an American. You say, where does that come from? Remember Paul in Acts chapter 22, he gets arrested. Paul got arrested quite often <laughs> for preaching the gospel. And he gets arrested and he gets mistreated. And you know what he says? I'm a Roman citizen. And they got all scared because they had, they had unlawfully treated him. And he says, I'm a Roman citizen. And he appeals to the citizenship from Rome. And, and then it changes the whole outcome of what they do because they've got to treat him differently than what they were. And he appealed to his Roman citizenship. And we have to appreciate the fact that we, in this country, uh, have certain uh, rights and privileges afforded to us because we are in this nation and we have a constitution and we have a bill of rights we have amendments that we can uh, can live by in this nation freely and we can enjoy it. so when you leave here today number one you are a human <laughs> number two you are a christian number three you're an american but above all what matters is that you're in christ Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the redemption that we have in Christ. That this redemption is not, uh, is certainly spiritual first and foremost, by all means. But it has practical implications. It affects how we live, just as Paul called them out in Galatians chapter 2, saying they were not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel. And that's our problem today. Lord, we're not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. We must process everything through what the scriptures teach us so that our worldview is not infringed upon by leftist ideology, but that our view of creation, our view of origin, our view of human life, the sanctity of human life, of gender, of sexuality, of all of these things, of, of so-called races, that all of these things are influenced, our thinking is influenced by Scripture and not by leftist ideology. Help us, Lord, to overcome, uh, to, to be those who believe and live by the truth. Help us to shine as a light in the world to the nations around us, to the people around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.